Good morning, everyone. Uh, lovely to see you all. Welcome to our event. Now, I'm starting bang on time. We've got quite a lot to get through. Um, I suspect there'll be lots of people joining as we go. Um, so I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you all here today. And I'm pretty uh, overwhelmed, actually, with the amount of interest we've had in this subject. Obviously, this is a super, super important area um, and lots of people wanting to do the best they can in it. So I'm really, really pleased with the interest we've got and the, the number of people who are joining us today. And we are recording it for those people who have colleagues that aren't able to join us today as well. So this is a learning event. There'll be a little bit of sort of providing, uh, people like me providing some information, but on the whole, uh, we're here to listen to our colleagues from Sheffield Local Authority who have already set up an auto award process to get to, to, to find out some details really about how they've managed to do that uh, and potentially to encourage other areas to see if they can do the same thing. So we are doing this as a collaboration um, uh, hosted by the University of York, the Fix Our Food Project and the Food Foundation, as well as our colleagues uh, from uh, Sheffield Local Authority. So big, big welcome. Now, for those of you who haven't sort of been to a webinar with this kind of screen before, um, you'll notice that there's this kind of different buttons along the, uh, along the bottom of your screen. It's going to be a really interactive session. So we're going to be providing information and then we're going to be pausing and asking people to ask questions. And we really do welcome uh, questions from, from anybody and, uh, you know, no question is, is stupid. Um, now, to do that, you'll be asked to use the Q&A function. So it's not a chat function, it's a Q&A function. Um, and if somebody else posts a question that you think is really important and you definitely want that to be answered, there's also the ability to, to click it so that you can like it and it then moves up in, in the list. Now, um, uh, one of one of our partners from the Food Foundation, uh, Dr. Annie Connolly, is going to come in and give you a little bit more information about um, about what's going to happen. You know what that process is actually going to going to look like. So I'm just going to just kick things off. So you'll see my you'll see my name there, Mar Maria Bryant. I'm predominantly based. Uh, at the University of York, where I'm a professor of public health nutrition, uh, but I also lead the diet, nutrition, obesity work for Born in Bradford. Spend quite a bit of my time supporting local authorities, particularly anything related to food and within uh, within evaluation. Um, and one of the projects that I that I work on is called Fix Our Food. Um, this is a, a, a food transformation project funded through the UKRI. Um, and its aim is to, trans to transform the whole of the UK food systems. There are three general uh, overarching subsystems within that work, one of which is the early years and school systems is the one that, that I lead. Uh, but we also work with other subsystems that we integrate across, uh, including regenerative farming and uh, hybrid business models. Um, now, we, we're not here to talk about Fix Our Food. However, for people who are interested to learn more, please do feel free to get in touch. And at the end, you'll, uh, you'll get uh, to be able to see our email addresses so that if you don't already know them, that you can get in contact with us. Um, so yeah, so with the, 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 the general aim of the, of the wider programme is to transform the Yorkshire food system get those lessons moving uh, to support uh, transformation outside of Yorkshire. Uh, and that's led by uh, professors Bob Doherty uh, uh, and uh, Catherine Denby. Uh, it does also include a large number of organizations and partners, uh, people producing food, our farmers, of course, and other businesses. Uh, but particular, uh, particular for us in terms of our system is our partnership with the Food Foundation. Um, I'm really happy that we're, we're able to do this uh, with them today. Um, our subsystem has a vision uh, that tasty, healthy and sustainable food is the default for all children. And actually um, what we have very much done is moved away from mere equity and what we want to do is target those in greatest need, which is what this project is all about. So very much in, in bringing it with this project. Um, so with that in mind, can I ask for the slides to go up, please? Brilliant. So I think I've just got a couple of couple of holder slides. So if you wouldn't mind moving on to the next slide, we will be able to share these slides with people, <clears throat> excuse me, so that you'll uh, um, you'll have access to some of the things that we skip by a little bit more quickly. So and the next slide. Perfect, perfect. Okay, so just to begin by telling you things you probably 
most of you already know about and it but it always does shock me given how tight the criteria are uh, to, to meet to be able to be um, eligible for free school meals um, it always shocks me how how many people in the population uh, uh, are actually entitled so the data aren't particularly brilliant but it's a it's approximately 23 percent um, nationally uh, who who are entitled to free school meals. In Yorkshire, this is slightly higher, uh, which is actually more striking because we have such diversity in Yorkshire where some areas are, are hugely affluent, meaning that those that, that are more deprived are exceptionally deprived. What we also know, although again, the data are not brilliant and pretty old now, is that about 11% of people who are entitled don't apply. Um, and uh, the evidence suggests this is for a number of different reasons. It could be something as simple as administration, uh, which is you know, very disappointing to hear. But there are technical burdens uh, and language and lit literacy barriers as well. Um, so aside from these kind of access barriers, I think what is well recognised now is the notion of uh, stigma uh, and perceived uh, shame as well associated uh, with, with um, becoming eligible for free school meals. Next slide. So what this means, of course, is that about one in 10 children don't receive the free school meals that they are entitled to. And therefore, they fail to get that hot, healthy dinner that often is the only hot, healthy dinner that they will get that day. Um, and, and, and because of the extra cost that incurs in terms of having to pay for lunches, families are not getting the financial benefit. Um, added to that, because there is a pupil premium, um, linked to free school meals, the schools also don't get the funding um, that's associated with that because it depends on the number, the, the, the registration of that. Okay, next slide, please. So what do we think, uh, what are we thinking about doing? Uh, we want to do something about this. We want to make this easy. We don't want uh, parents and families to have to rely on this. Um, and we know that for a while, the, the concept of auto enrollment as a process uh, has been discussed, but not really moved forward that much further until, of course, we discovered that Sheffield were already doing this and it got us all very excited. Um, so what we want to do is engage with stakeholders. We've already started doing this to try to work out uh, whether we're able to do this in Yorkshire in the first instance as a proof of concept. Now, I know that there are people here that are based outside of Yorkshire and, and everything that we say pretty much today is going to be relevant to you as well. Um, but we are working hard to, to, to engage with as many people as possible. The next thing is the learning event. That's today. So obviously we're, we're already in some ways to meet our aim. Um, and then what we want to do is to provide some implementation support and some free resources uh, to local authorities to help them set up auto enrollment. Um, and then those that are based in, in Yorkshire particularly uh, will be doing an evaluation of uh, how it's implemented, but importantly, the impact of that. So yeah, so whilst this is a very much uh, a set up as a, law, a Yorkshire kind of legacy project, actually uh, the learning particularly from today will be relevant out, outside of Yorkshire. Uh, and we have um, Miles Bremner going to talk to us later about what that might mean nationally as well, what, what we can do using this evidence, this information uh, as a call for, for change at a national level. So excited about that. Right, so I think, can I get, can I have the next slide? I'm passing you over to Dr. Annie Connolly, who uh, is going to take us through the process. Over to you, Annie. Hi, everybody. Um, I don't know if you can see me or not, but I'm saying hello and giving you a wave. Um, I just wanted to explain um, what we're going to be doing today. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Um, so as Maria said, um, we Maria and I started thinking about um, the issue of children missing out on free school meals, those that are actually entitled, and then um, heard that Sheffield had already um, adopted uh, various processes that they call the auto award process. And we spoke to them last August, actually, to hear about um, their auto award process. And, and we were really impressed by the massive impact this, is, this had had on the number of children and the amount of people premium funding that was um, being funneled to schools as a result of their, um, the processes that they had put in place. So we invited them to, um, to, the webinar today 
to share their all their learnings and their background and the idea is that um, they go into quite a lot of detail and we're very happy for um, you to be asking questions about detail and so what we've done today is we're, we're, we're splitting up the webinar into various sections and Sarah and Annabelle are going to talk first of all about the history and background um, what it was that kind of set off their thinking and 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 the process uh, and getting the process put in place, and then we're going to stop and have time for a Q and A. And as Maria said, if you can put that in, if you can put your questions into the Q and A section, and then they're going to go on to talk about um, what they faced when they were trying to implement the process. And various processes and the barriers that they face and the different technical issues and then we're going to stop again and you can ask more questions and don't worry if it's a very detailed technical question um Anna uh, Annabelle and Sarah will do their best to answer that and th this is the space for that and then they're going to go on to share the fantastic impact that they've had since 2016 and uh, we'll stop again for Q, uh, a Q&A session um, and then we've got Miles Bremner, who is the ex-director of the School Food Plan, which I suspect many of you um, read, um, and also coordinates the School Food Review Working Group. So he's really involved in and passionate about this issue, actually, and, um, and talks to lots of people about it nationally. So he's going to spend a bit of time um, sharing what uh, the issues are and the conversations that he's been having on a national level. And then we're going to close with um, uh, Maria and I just um, talking about the next steps. So um, I'm really uh, pleased to say that we're to time at the moment. Um, and yeah, I'm really pleased to introduce um, Sarah and Annabelle, who are going to start um, um, by talking about history and background uh, um, and tell you about Sheffield's Auto Award process. So Sarah and Annabelle, thank you very much. Thank you, Annie. Um, I, I'm Sarah Kavanagh. I think I'm going to start us off and then Annabelle's going to f follow on from me. Um, so thank you for inviting us today. I'll give you a little bit of context to our auto award process in Sheffield, the background and history of it, really. Uh, this is the, the more boring, but Annabelle's got the really interesting stuff that, that, that you need to know. Um, so first of all, I work for the School Food Service based within the Education and Skills Portfolio in Sheffield City Council. Um, and I lead on free school meals. The School Food Service manages a catering contract on behalf of over 100 schools in Sheffield. And we also offer advice and support to all schools around everything to do with school meals and free school meals. Um, in Sheffield, the responsibility for free school meal policy sits within the School Food Service, while customer services deliver the free school meal service on our behalf through a service level agreement. Um, so the project itself, our auto award process is the outcome of a project I undertook in 2015 as part of the council's tackling inequality and childhood poverty agenda. In 2015, I was tasked by one of our councillors to explore the idea of a passport of benefits or automatic award process for schools for free, uh, for free school meals and to try and identify why a fifth of all eligible pupils didn't take their free school meal entitlement. Um, and we're not eating that daily meal. We also recognised that since the implementation of universal infant free school meals in 2014, many schools suffered a shortfall in funding in terms of pupil premium as parents didn't feel the need to apply for a free income based free school meal and share their household income details when, when they were already, already getting a free school meal. Schools were spending a huge amount of time and resources trying to persuade parents to fill in free school meal application forms. So the key objectives of my project were to identify models of good practice and successful strategies for schools to increase free school meal eligibility and take up and to maximise pupil premium funding for schools. Um, the project itself involved working with 18 schools across Sheffield, talking to head teachers and business managers. I identified a group of primary schools which represented each of the seven localities within the city, enabling an understanding of the challenges and issues faced by schools in a wide range of communities, and with a particular focus on one locality in an area of deprivation and changing demographics. I was also given the contact details of the communications officer for Paul Blomfield MP in the Houses of Parliament, 
who provided me with information about the free school meal automatic registration of eligible children parliamentary bill dated 2015 compelling local authorities to register all children who are eligible for free school meals. The All Party Parliamentary Group on Hunger, chaired by Frank Fields MP, had also published a report, a route map to ending hunger in December 2015, which included useful information on automatic registration, including local authorities that were already running an automatic registration, automatic registration programme. I talked to a number of those local authorities and found two in particular, Wirral and Calderdale, that had found a positive way forward and had changed their practices regarding the award of free school meals to one that required no specific application process for families. In other words, an automatic award process for free school meals. I must apologise, I've got a tickly cough and it always comes just when I don't want it to. Sorry. The two local authorities were happy to share their experience and best practice with me. And as the result of that, I put together two case studies that I was then able to take back and present to our senior managers as a way forward for us to explore in Sheffield. The next step from that was to get the right services around the table um, to make it happen. Namely, those services were the school food service, um, information, um, government's team who advised and guided us around data protection um, and the use of sensitive data, information systems, um, which is where Annabelle comes in, who deals with the systems and data side of things, revenue and benefits, who helped us with the protocols and systems, and customer services, um, who provide the resources and operational response um, to manage or to award process. Um, and it, it has been a hugely successful collaborative effort that come to, across co po different portfolios that continues to this day. Um, it's resulted in the introduction and implementation of the auto work process in 2016 as a mechanism to increase free school meal eligibility and maximise pupil premium funding for schools. We will talk about the impact of this a little bit later on this morning. Um, but essentially, we identify families that have claimed housing benefit or council tax support, but have not applied for free school meals. We then contact the families to ensure that they're claiming everything that they're entitled to. This is an annual process that takes place during August and September, as eligibility for pupil premium is based on known free school meal eligibility, as recorded on the October census, school census. Um, so, um, this is, this is the process that continues to this day. We've been doing this since 2016 now. There were some other outcomes from the project, one of which was the production of a free school meal toolkit for schools, sharing models of good practice, practice and initiatives for increasing the take of free school meals, maximising pupil premium funding and providing advice and guidance on all free school meal, to, free school meal matters. For example, universal credit and transitional protection. And we're currently updating it now with information about no recost to public funds. Um, we've also introduced a free school meal data dashboard for schools, benchmarking their own free school meal take up data against the schools in their locality and citywide. Schools are very competitive and they like to know that they're getting a, a greater uptake than others, perhaps, that, that it kind of focuses their attention on not only the number of eligible children in their school, but the number of children that are taking up that free school meal. So that's another piece of work that we do for schools. Um, after the Q&A session, Annabelle's going to go into far more detail about how the auto award process works, how we implemented it, and the barriers that we overcame. Thank you. That's, that's my part done. Don't know if we've got any questions. Thank you. That's brilliant. Thank you, Sarah. So, so much, so much in there. Um, so we do have one question. <laughs> um, will you offer links to your free school meal toolkit for schools or other links to key documents, please? Is this these sorts of things, uh, things that you are happy to share? We are happy to share any documents that we've got around um, or our auto award process. That, um, absolutely fine. That's not a problem. The toolkit is currently under under review. We're updating it, and every time we get to a point where we've updated it, something else changes. So, but as soon as that is updated, yeah, we're we're, we're more than happy to share it with people. Thank you. 
that's that's super kind. So um, I actually have a, a question about uh, the political will uh, when you set this 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 thing rolling. Uh, first of all, did you did you feel like you needed political will, the degree to which, and if you did, how how you achieved that? I think we were fortunate in Sheffield that it was one of our councillors that came to us and and tasked us. Um, to, to explore this idea and see if we could get it in place. So, and I think there were other things happening. Um, so sort of the Frank Beals um, um, report and the, the parliamentary bill that he was trying to push through at that time. So I think we were quite fortunate that, that we had that, that support behind us at the time. You already had that sort of, you were there at the right time and you, and you already had that backing. And, and how important do you think that is? I think it, I mean, it was important for us at the time and the, and the, it, it made it easier for us to go back to senior managers and to get people around the table at that time to make it happen. Um, I think we're in a difference. Um, I, think, I think now with the cost of living crisis and the sort of push for universal school meals in primary schools and things like that, there's a, there's a great focus on on getting children onto free school meals. So I, I would imagine that, I would like to think that that support's there for it to happen anyway. Yeah, uh, it's a positive, it should be a positive. It, it should be a positive. There are lots of drivers there at the moment yeah. Um, yeah. to make it happen. I think that's just my personal view. Yeah, <laughs> probably everybody on the webinar shares <laughs> that opinion, by the way. Yeah. Um, so we do have another question. You did mention a couple of local authorities that you were already aware of doing things in this space when you were, when you were setting mm. up yourself. So uh, can, is there any, any more detail that you can share about what they were doing? Um, I wrote at two case studies at the time that I've got. They were Wirral and Calderdale. Slightly different setup to ours and much smaller local authorities, but it kind of gave us a, a, a sort of an idea about how, that, how they managed to to access the data and be able to use it and things. So although we had to adapt it to Sheffield and to our processes, and I would imagine other local authorities would mm -hmm. have to do the same. We don't all work in the same way. So I have got those case studies. I probably need to check that those people are still there and that they're happy for me to share that. And I don't know whether they're still running the process in the same way anymore, um, right. but I'm happy right. to share. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, much appreciated. Um, a question as well about clarification of whether the auto enrolment process is just for primary schools or both primary and secondary. Uh, nursery, primary and secondary. Yeah, so, so, yeah, so not that. just those two. Yeah. No. Thank you, Annabelle. Okay. Right, so we didn't anticipate huge numbers of questions at this point because obviously the further we, we go in, the more these questions appear. But please do continue to put questions in the Q&A, everybody. Right, really happy then to introduce you, Annabelle. Uh, hello, hello everyone, uh, thank you for coming. Um, my name is Annabelle and I am a data and uh, integration project manager for Sheffield City Council. Um, and I'm going to start my section by giving you three incredibly exciting paragraphs from the DFE's uh, electronic checking system, free school meal legal compliance guide. Um, because in talking to a number of local authorities over the last year, um, what what we thought was kind of common knowledge has turned out quite has turned out not to be. Um, so um, brace yourselves. Uh, the first paragraph is around consent. So consent is not a requirement to undertake processing for the purposes of dealing with requests for free school meals because that function is a public task. Where an online processing scheme includes eligible eligibility checking via the ECS, that's the government system, as part of the process. Similarly, consent is not a requirement for the purposes of determining eligibility of claimants for free school lunches or milk. This is because the function is a public task, section 110 to the Education Act. However, to obtain consent where it is feasible is regarded as good practice. That's the first paragraph. The second paragraph is around the application process. Education Act, section 512 ZB, for this purpose, a person is eligible for free lunches if a request that the lunches be provided free of charge has been made by him or on his behalf to the authority. Thus, there is no specified format for an application or more correctly, a request for free school meals to be made and is open to local authorities to use whatever methodology of processes will achieve the purpose of the scheme. 
And lastly, the who. It must be remembered that the only legal requirement for a local authority to award entitlement to free school meals is that a request is made by anyone, including such as a friend of the family, a teacher, a social worker, etc., by or on behalf of the parent or pupil. So given those three pieces of information directly from the DfE, it's quite clear that if you have the data, you can use it with no barriers to, to apply for free school meals. So the key element of this project was actually getting data that we could use. So we kind of thought, well, what we need is the national insurance number and we need details of children in the household. Who, who in the council has national insurance numbers? So that quite nicely led us on to going and speaking to the revenue and benefits team to ask whether or not they had access to the key pieces of information that we would need for this project. Uh, and they went away and they had to look and they said, yes, there is no technical barrier to giving you what you need out of our computer system. However, you will need to prove that you can have it. So we then approached our head of information governance with a proposal as to what we wanted and why. And they said, you'll need to do a DPIA. So it's a data protection impact assessment. Uh, and before anybody asks, we're more than happy to, to share it. Um, so that took around about kind of six months back and forth, uh, tweaking it around how we would store the data, the security, who would have access to it, what retention policies we were going to apply to it, what kind of legislation we wanted to look at. Um, so eventually our information governance were happy that there was a, a substantial uh, grounds for us to use the data to contact potential free school meal eligible families and beyond that to then process the data for benefit related free school meals. If, uh, if you remember, this was 2016 that we implemented this, so we, we did this pre-GDPR. Um, so at the time, uh, we relied on an opt out uh, a su sufficient basis for using the housing benefit data. Um, and that was how the letter was worded uh, to ask parents to opt out of use of the data. But obviously, as GDPR came in um, and they tightened up a lot of the kind of wording um, of you know, what we could use, opt out became a, a, a very um, kind of grey area and a very unstable um, way to, uh, to progress this project. So we, we sat back around the table with information governance. We redid the entire DPIA. Um, and the information governance team were uh, then happy that the same use of the data came under the remit of public task. Um, so the piece of wording that they that they gave to us is uh, our primary lawful basis is our public task. The council has a duty to provide free school meals to eligible children under section 512 of the Education Act. The council also has a secondary duty to help families access any support that they're entitled to under section 35 of the Digital Economy Act. As our primary lawful basis as our public task, we give parents and carers the right to object to this processing should they wish to. So that's kind of our, that was our, that was our setup. Um, and I'll now go into kind of what, what we actually do. So uh, at this kind of uh, early summer, so sort of June time, we have the data extracted from the housing benefit council tax revenue, revenue and benefits system with the fields that we require to both contact the families to advise them of what, the pro what, what our project is uh, and also to give them the right to object to the use of their data. Um, unfortunately, since, oh, sorry, unfortunately, but since the introduction of universal credit, um, free school meals has a hard earnings cap of seven and a half thousand pounds and that's not data that we can get from the housing benefits system so unfortunately the net goes slightly wider than we would like so we do the letter is very clear that the the person won't automatically be eligible for free school meals um, but we believe that there's a strong chance that they that they will be should should we check um, before we write to the households, uh, any household where the child is currently in receipt of free school meals is removed from the, the data set. So it's not just the child that we remove, we remove the entire 
household from the data set. So yes, we are absolutely removing children who should be entitled, but aren't claiming um, because we're removing them because an older sibling already gets. Um, but I'll cover how we mitigate some of that risk in the third session. Um, and the reason we do that is partly resource and cost to kind of tie down individual children to free school meals rather than just writing to the, the household as a whole um, would, would be quite cost, in, cost intensive. And secondly, we would be doing more processing of the data to identify the individual children who were already in receipt of free school meals rather than just saying the national insurance number exists in our free school meal data set therefore somebody in that household already receives free school meals and just strip them out so it's it's kind of two part one resource and cost but also because it would involve a bit of upfront processing of the data before we have asked for um, their, their kind of right to object to us to use the data. Uh, we then also remove any households where every child is younger than two or older than it's about 18 and a, 18 and a half, depending on where the, um, the birthday falls in relation to school census. Uh, we didn't do that the first couple of years. It was the first two years that we did it. Um, and we just sent it out to everybody. And we got an awful lot of telephone calls with people saying, my child is only four weeks old. Why are you writing to me about free school meals? Uh, which were quite, they were quite difficult conversations. Um, so uh, very strong learning curve. Uh, once we limited the data set to two and older, um, we still get some of the younger co uh, parents calling, you know, age two, age three. Uh, but we explain to them that the benefits will still apply um, should they put their child into a school nursery. Um, so it's still worthwhile us running those checks um, for nursery purposes. So the letters then go out to the benefit claimant, as I said, uh, stating that we believe that there are children in the household who could be missing out on free school meals. And it also means that the school um, or nursery that the child attends is potentially missing out on funding that is to directly support their child. Um, we and then say so we give them three weeks to object to the use of their data. We get very, very few people ring and object to the use of their data. Uh, in the main, it's people that are about to leave Sheffield. So they're moving house and they, they say, well, there's no point in me putting in a free school or claim. I'm not going to be living here in a few weeks. Um, people who we get a lot of the Y11 kind of age range, um, I say a lot, it's under 1% of, of all the letters that we send, um, ringing up to say, oh, my child's about to leave, they're not going to go on to do their, their GCSEs, they've had enough, they're going on to college, so we're doing the free school meals via the college. Um, and again, a few right at the, you know, right at the early ages saying, well, I'm definitely not going to put my child into nurseries and stuff. So, but in the whole, we very rarely get anybody contact us to object to the use of their data because it's 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 an benefit that you're entitled to so you know why I would why would you uh, after the three weeks have passed we uh, any one that's left remaining in that data set uh, we pass the national insurance number surnames and dates of birth up to the DFE's online batch checking system um, which all local authorities can have access to. It's a very simple process. You just nominate a super user and that's basically, basically it to manage accounts. Uh, so we upload a spreadsheet uh, about an hour or so later, we get a spreadsheet to download to say, these are the national insurance numbers you can award free school meals against. So we then pull those back in against the data set that contains the children. Uh, and then we pass those to our customer service team who do all of the manual keying over the summer holidays. Um, and that way, when the child starts school um, and that first week in September, the child is, it's, it's a hot meal on, on the first day, schools aren't having to chase them around the corridors with paper application forms saying, you know, please, please, please. So it's, you know, as Sarah mentioned in the, in the first section, it's a huge burden um, taken off of taken off of schools, and it means that uh, that the children get that that hot meal um, above the universal infant ones who get it anyway. But they get that hot meal on on day one. 
um, with regards to the effort that that takes um, for the housing benefit uh, team, the Revs and Bens, it takes them no effort whatsoever. They have a report, they press a button, they uh, send the report securely. That's it. It takes them probably less than five minutes, you know, once a year. Uh, for the data matching, so that's around stripping the original, the households out, stripping out the age two and age 19, stripping out anybody that calls. That takes around about a couple of a couple of weeks. Um, it's it's quite an intensive piece of piece of work to get that data matching done and the the letters out to the households. Um, and then the data input for the claims that come back as eligible. That again takes our customer services a good couple of weeks. So it's a very small team. There's uh, two or three people that work on the inputting. There's one person that works on the data matching. So, uh, and then sort of, you know, myself and Sarah to kind of oversee, making sure everything's still on track, uh, letters are, are going out on time, that kind of thing, making sure resources in place in case of sick leave and, and things like that. So it's it's kind of less than less than six people for two weeks out of out of a, a year. Um, so that's um, that's that's what we do. So if we move on to the Q&A section. That's great. So much information in there. I will remind people that we are recording. And so, uh, you know, they can go back and get the details. Um, and you were, you know, the, the lack of slides was intentional. Um, it's nice. It's refreshing, in fact, uh, to, to, to listen to you without looking at the slides. So thank you. Really thank you for that. Um, and the question has come up, which is unsurprising, but that you have just started to talk about there in terms of resources um, so you've sort of very clearly outlined the time the time required for that but there's also something about who does that so it, it, this is adding some adding something to someone's existing role or do you bring in different new people just to do this <laughs> I do it imagine <laughs> <laughs> I do it I've never found uh, despite the fact I'm a project manager and this is quite clearly business as usual I've I've never found anybody to uh, hand it over to so uh, there, there's very detailed process notes and there are um, people who are well aware of what to do and how to do it and people that have shadowed me um, mm -hmm. So if I got run over by a bus tomorrow, it, you know, I'm not a single point of failure. It can be picked up. Um, however, as I'm sure every local authority is, um, abundance of staff is not a, not a luxury that we have. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Can you just remind everybody the time of year that that happens? So is, there, um, is this something that you give up your holidays for? Yeah, we do it over the summer, over the summer holidays. It takes about two weeks over the summer holidays. Uh, we used to do it over Christmas because the funding used to be in the January census for schools. So what we what one of our primary drivers for it is, is to get the funding um, into into the school budget and that the school budget one is now October. So um, we get get all of the children kind of on and over the summer holidays so that by the time the school submits their census in October, um, every that they're submitting the highest number of free school meal eligible children that they possibly can to trigger the related pupil premium funding. Yeah, that's great. And actually related to that, um, Jane has asked about, you know, this being annual. Like you have said, yes, it is annual. But what what how do you manage children that who become eligible uh, through the year? Is there a process for that? So we have our standard um, web, app, web application, telephone application, uh, application via schools. Um, so all of that still stands. This doesn't replace that. Um, but then we have a number of other schemes that we run through the year. But I am going to cover those in the last section. So um, if I go into detail now, I'll have nothing to talk about. <laughs> yeah, OK, OK, uh, great. Um, so I've got some more questions here. So one uh, from Dana. Hi, how uh, does the rollout of universal credit affect local authorities being able to access the data at all? Uh, yes, because not everybody who is entitled to universal credit will claim council tax. So we did see a slight drop off 
as we so Sheffield is only still at 60 percent legacy to universal credit transfer so we stand 40 percent of all of our families on legacy benefits um so we, we we have seen a bit of a drop off which is why we have implemented kind of lots of other wraparound schemes that i'll talk about in the third section um to kind of prop this up um and it was never intended to be more than uh one or two years this this project it was always going to be uh let's bump up our numbers let's kind of um you know get on board with increasing you know people understanding that they should be applying for free school meals it'll do mm -hmm. it will be one one year or maybe two and then we'll, we'll never do it again and um it, it has just been so successful that it's it would be daft to to stop it yeah yeah, brilliant. And, and we're going to hear a little bit more about that in a little while. So I do have a few more questions. I think I'm still in, we've still got plenty of time. So I'll, I'll, ca I'll carry on working through them. Um, so I'm hoping you, you understand this one. It's not, it's not something that I understand. Uh, have you done a CBA? I can see Sarah's come on. So there might be questions that are more relevant to, to Sarah or, 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 or you, Annabelle. So feel free to both, both answer. I would need to know what a CBA stands for. CBA. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. No, so it's probably the answer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, so cost then... benefit analysis. God, and here's me telling you I'm a project manager, cost benefit analysis. <laughs> uh, yes, um, Sarah will go into the, um, the benefits in the next section and We've never actually done a cost benefit analysis because you will see from Sarah's section uh, in the following one, there really is no, no need, no need to work out what it costs us yeah. to do with yeah, the amount I, of benefit yeah. that it generates. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree with that. And actually, uh, Anna's asked the question about the number of children that are, end up uh, with the, get, getting a meal who wouldn't have done. But we'll we'll hold off on that answering that one because you'll you'll. Uh, you'll get that information in a, in a little while. Um, okay, so Chris is asking, how do you process children due to start nursery prior to attendance data being available? So we pick those up by one of our other um, by one of our other processes. We do a lot of work with um, early years to pick them up via the two year fell and early years pupil premium that I'll come on to in the in the third section. Right, great. So more, more information to come. What I will add to that, and Annie will be talking about this later, is that we don't just stop here after this event. Uh, so that we appreciate there's lots of little details here that there's lots to take on board uh, in, in just a webinar. So it, it certainly doesn't stop stop here. So, OK, super. Uh, we do have lots of questions coming in. I'm going to ask Annie to uh, to let me know if there's anything particular that you want us to focus on and please as audience uh, make sure you like questions that um uh you uh that you want to be answered because they'll they'll end up topping us on, on the top of the list so uh, annie is there anything particular that you'd like to re reiterate there's quite a few questions about sending information and the stuff over and i think we people's email addresses we can do that afterwards Mm -hmm. so if that's the kind of question people have asked we can we can send that out afterwards and great okay so thank you um I, I, and victoria i think that question has been answered uh, already in terms of um oh okay have you done a qualitative evaluation sorry so knowing that the cb the cost benefit analysis um wasn't needed have you done any qualitative work uh, to ask what the impact from the household perspective is i guess the same could be true for schools as well yeah, you did some, Sarah, didn't you? I think after the first session where you asked schools for like anecdotal, you know, what is it? How are they finding it? So we did it via the schools rather than via um, the parent and the households. Um, so we asked schools to kind of canvas, mm. you know, um, what does this mean to your your families? Um, so I think you got got quite a section of feedback from that, didn't you, Sarah? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'll probably cover that in impact, but, but yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean it's the, 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 all the stuff around parents saving at least £400 a year per child per year by getting a free school meal instead of having to pay for meals. And, and it's all that stuff around um, parents having to apply to fill in an application form. Um, 
there was there were some things came out of it out of the project that I did around things like signposting that whether free school meals are signposted well enough mm-hmm. um both by DWP and by local authorities and by us and whether um you know families were slipping through the net for whatever reason and 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 are we making it easy enough for them to apply do do we tell them how to apply and how they might be eligible so some and, and that's why it led on to other pieces of work that we've done since then um Mm-hmm. So we'll hear a little bit more about that, but it doesn't. Uh, from what I'm hearing, you're not hearing anything negative, or did did, did you no. hear anything? No, yeah. we've, not, we've not had any negative feedback. Oh, the, the, no, we've not had any neg- negative feedback about it at all. Oh, oh, the only negative feedback, and it wasn't really feedback, is when we sent the, particularly the first couple of years, Annabelle, when we sent the the letters out to parents and and said, do you want, to, can't, are we, do you, are you happy for us to use your data or do you want to to opt out? And we did have a couple of parents at least that contacted us and said, we absolutely don't <laughs> want our school to receive any money whatsoever. We've fallen out <laughs> of the school for whatever reason. We don't want them to benefit from us getting free school meals at all. Please take us out of this process. We don't want to be involved. Oh my um, goodness. Now that is a, yeah. a, a, a something yeah. that I would never have expected. But... No, I mean, it were quite, we were quite surprised as well. <laughs> but it would be better to forego yeah. the free school meals so that the school didn't benefit from the pupil premium funding which was unusual. That was sort of right at the beginning, really, when we got bigger numbers and things, but but we've not really had that since. And I don't mm. think the other opt-outs that we've had where parents have been in touch to say, don't use our data, were, were things like, um, you know, my child's going to be moving on to to sixth form or to, to post-16 college, or, mm. or they just don't want the meal, they're really not interested in having the meal. And then we would try and persuade parents that, you know, by by at least you don't have to have the meal on the plate by applying for free school meals. It does mean that school will get additional funding to support your child in school. So, so we did some try to persuade parents, um, but we didn't. We, we've not really had any negative feedback mm-hmm. at all mm-hmm. on this. Well, it's interesting you should just say you say that because we do have a question um, about that, uh, and that is that uh, whether or not there's any understanding or you've been able to record um how i know we're going to talk about how many children become eligible but have you got any information on how many children actually eat this eat the food so the uptake the uptake of the of the school meals um and not as such i think this is a problem that all local authorities have actually we and it, and, and it is a problem in, Sheff, in sheffield despite the project that i did it is still a problem the 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 eligibility versus take up um, so we've tried to do an awful lot of work in our schools, working with the catering providers, working with the schools, provision of the data dashboard, which highlights the schools. You know, it's not it's not just that we've got them recorded as free school meal eligible. What are you doing about these children that aren't taking the meal up um, mm-hmm. and, and trying to get schools to focus on that a little bit? But it, it is a gap and it is a problem even now. Um, so we've not got any specific data school food service probably would have actually but only for our catering catering contract schools right that, you know we'd be able to identify what the gap is between eligibility and take up for those schools. sounds like another whole project of joining well, data together doesn't it an ongoing thing too yeah yeah. <laughs> um, so we, so. yeah sorry to interrupt you sarah um so we so we still have time in this q a section um i'm going to the most popular questions next so uh there's a question about Oh, somebody's just put something in, which means I have to scroll up. Excuse, excuse me. Uh, could this auto enrolment also be applied to Healthy Start schemes? So I don't know whether you've thought about that. Uh, Healthy Start contacted us um, probably around about Christmas time to ask, and there was a reason why it couldn't be. And I'm racking my brains to think why it couldn't. <laughs> It was just something to do with the the data for free school meals wasn't it wasn't a data match that we couldn't get the information about the healthy start but I'm I'm racking my brains to think why but I will have it yeah in, okay in an email, don't worry so. don't worry what I was also going to let everybody know is that we are going to use all the questions so even if we don't get to your question we're going to look at all of them and we're going to generate a Q&A document that we'll share with everyone that's registered mm. so if it comes back to you Annabelle then we can add that we can add that to that so that's no problem at all 
Um, so um, there's uh, there's more information here about sharing the DFE guidance. I think in line what, with what Annie has said, we'll go back to these and anything that can be shared, we will Absolutely. definitely share. Uh, I think particularly those sections, those legal sections that you were reading out, Annabelle, would be really, really helpful for people when in having those conversations. Well, I'm reading. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so there's, a, I guess, a quick question. Uh, is there a charge for schools to use the service? Not specifically for auto award, and we do all of this for our maintained schools for, for free. We don't charge our maintained schools, but for everything free school meal related from processing an application form to dealing with the school on the parent's behalf to reporting, um, uh, we do charge for for academies at I think I'm going to be right in saying Sarah 150 a head 150 per pupil yeah yeah right okay doke thank you um there's actually a few questions that relate to DFE so I'm just gonna yeah I don't you don't have to answer this but um what has the reaction to your project been uh, from DFE uh, I don't think we've ever actually sat them down and said this is what we're this is what we're doing they've, they've come and sat with us a few times around about you know with our with our processes I think the last time they sat with us was around about six months prior to COVID hitting when they were interested in what we were going to do about how we would manage the transit transitional protection process when that came to an end so they've kind of sat with us and they've looked over our processes but we've never actually had a had a session and said what do you think about what do you think about this so uh, okay. yeah, well there's no probably idea. some people here today maybe that can let let, <laughs> let us know in the uh, q a um so uh there's a couple of few questions that are some acronyms i'm assuming well i'm hoping you'll know them but i will ask our audience to try to spell out their acronyms if they wouldn't mind so um, is your web application an automated check on the DFE ECS or does it require a person to process the ap application? Requires a person to process it. We're massively behind in that kind of um, that kind of tech. We are hoping that so it's been on the on the project plan to move our web application to um, the automated to hook it up to ECS. Um, but trying to find the money for it when people apply because we have so many different processes as you'll see when we come on to the next section because we have so many processes that um allow us to kind of capture the data and put free school meals on in a in a method that doesn't require the parent to actually apply parental applications is our lowest route into free school meals for Sheffield right. yeah. we have seen a little bit of an uptick for because of the household support fund so as Sarah mentioned uh, we, we both lead on that as well so we only give out food vouchers in the main to parents who are in receipt of a benefit related free school meal so children who would have been picked up at various points in the year of our processes want the money want the half-term food vouchers so have applied earlier so mm -hmm. since covid we have seen a little uptick in um, kind of web-based and phone-based applications right. but it is still our lowest um, our lowest route in but yes eventually we will have a connection to ECS. Yeah. And it also. seems like the technology is there it's just getting well, it's been there for ages it's just, the, yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah that's the next the next project yeah uh, we have one one more minute left um for for uh, before we move on to the next se session I'm just trying to see if there's anything um if there's anything quickly that i can ask you some of the ones that are uh more popular i think are a little bit more complex oh there is a quick one is the charge 150 pound a head for academies or one pound fifty one pound good question <laughs> very good sorry. question yeah sorry one pound fifty <laughs> great okay the so entire, it's perfectly, the entire perfectly year. timed yeah. <laughs> all right so i think we're on to you now sarah and and if we could oh. have uh slide number eight please okay so i'm going to talk through the impact um of auto award in sheffield um and it has had a significant impact for us have you got the slide oh. Have you got the slide that shows the um, the table 
I'll talk through it anyway. That's the one. So, so first of all, we've got more children now having access to healthy free school meals. Um, so to date, and this doesn't, I don't think this includes the 22, 23 data, but today an additional 3,285 primary and secondary age children have been awarded free school meals and 2,118 early years children identified as eligible for free school meals when they reach school age. Um, ensuring that most disadvantaged children have access to at least one good meal a day at school. Um, and as I said earlier, it also means that a parent can save a, a, around £400 per child per year through taking up the free school meal entitlement. Um, with transitional protection as well, um, this means that these children will continue to receive free school meals until the end of full, full universal credit rollout. Um, currently March 2025, and will continue to receive their entitlement until the end of their phase of education, regardless of any changes to parental income. So if they win the lottery tomorrow, they'll still continue to get the free school meal. Um, in Sheffield, oh, as Annabelle's already outlined, actually, um, we use the household support fund to provide food vouchers for free school meal eligible children in the school holidays, something else that Annabelle and I lead on. Um, and the auto award process has enabled more families to benefit from the food vouchers during the cost of living crisis. We currently have approximately 28,000 children eligible for free school meals in Sheffield. Um, secondly, um, we've um, introduction of auto award process has, in, has resulted in significant additional pupil premium funding for schools. Since 2016, an additional 3.8 million has been generated for schools to provide targeted support to improve the life chances of disadvantaged children and young people. In reality, the total will be greater than 3.8 million as that doesn't take into account the cumulative year on year effect of ever six. So it's estimated that the real total is at least 10 million pounds so far. Um, and the pupil premium funding will help children from low income families to reach their full potential and progress onto further and higher education and ultimately lead to improved employment opportunities in the future. And I don't think we can underestimate the importance of pupil premium funding in schools. They really do depend on that money to support vulnerable children. Um, We've also reduced the burden on schools. Schools use valuable time and resources to encourage parents to apply for income based free school meals to secure their rightful entitlement and to help maximise pupil premium funding. So the auto award process removes the need for them to do that and secures more stable funding for schools based on the true entitlement to free school meals. Um, as we develop other processes to our, that, that we'll, Annabelle's gonna talk about in a second, as we develop other processes to identify children who would be eligible, we would expect to see a natural drop off in the number of children we're picking up through auto award process. As you can see from the table um, on the slide, the figures have dropped year on year. Um, so I will now pass you over to Annabelle, who will talk to you about all the further actions and the other process that we, processes that we have in Sheffield um, to increase free school meal eligibility and maximise pupil premium funding. Thank you, Annabelle. Fantastic. Uh, so as I mentioned in uh, in the uh, section that I did that we strip out household, you know, anybody in the household, the entire household, when anybody uh, claims free school meals. These are some of the things that we implemented uh, after the auto award um, to try and kind of plug uh, plug gaps and uh, and kind of boost the numbers further. Um, so. The first thing we do is with early years. So with our age two, two-year-old funding children, um, the award for two-year-old funding, which is the 15 hours free nursery uh, hours that two-year-olds can, can receive um, when parents are on a low income, uh, the eligibility is almost identical to free school meals. The only difference is that for free school meals, there's a hard earnings cap of seven and a half, and it's double that for um, for two-year-old funding. So in general, it's the same cohort of, of children. So when they uh, apply for two-year-old funding, we collect consent from the parent to reuse the data that they've given us, so national insurance number, surname and date of birth, uh, to check whether or not the child will be entitled to uh, early years pupil premium, which is the same as school age pupil premium, just an awful lot 
less, but it, it has the exact same eligibility criteria for, for free school meals once they move up. So we start collecting the data uh, the minute the child hits our uh, education system. That's our kind of our first point of, of entry. Once a child moves uh, or stays in nursery, so almost all of our two year old funding children stay in nursery, because if you're getting 15 hours at two, why would you take your child out at age three they just don't so it's the same the same cohort of children but it's obviously added to because at 50 at age three every child receives kind of 15 hours universal um so not only are we then porting the data from our two-year-old funding uh, applications for the national insurance number to check for early years pupil premium which means the child mind or the nursery don't have to do it because we do it automatically and we send out with the nursery headcount, the notifications as to which children are entitled to early years pupil premium. Any child that then enters that uh, cohort as well, when the child minder is collecting the data, the parent is, is given a consent form at the time to say, now that you've started nursery, we're going to reuse the, your national insurance number, surname and date of birth when your child goes up to uh, school reception in order to ensure that you know, we check for preschool meals and the school receives the correct support for your child. Um, so we get all of those as well at age three. Um, then when they go into reception, we then already have a bulk of national insurance numbers from anybody that's been through our nursery element. Um, but also when we send out the electronic school admissions forms for reception at age four, Again, we collect consent to say, please give us your national insurance number, surname and date of birth uh, and your consent. And we will check for a free school meal application prior to you starting school. So before a child ever steps foot on a school premises, we've been collecting their free school meal applications for years. So by the time this, this child turns up on that first day, the schools, the schools already have such a host of, of data ready that they're not having to do registration packs and they're not having to, you know, say, chase, chase parents around the, around the school, you know, with forms to say, we do need you to fill this form in. Um, we do the same when you apply for a secondary school place. So that goes out on the admissions form to say, can we have your consent to check for free school meals? And then we also do, and then the last thing is obviously the catch-all that wraps around that is the yearly auto award. Um, something else we offer that's not on this slide as well is that we uh, allow schools, rather than do one application at a time via our web service, which only allows you to apply for, um, I think it's a couple of children at any one at any one point. We also offer schools a batch service. So schools can fill in a template spreadsheet with all the children that they want um, checking on and they send it through to us and it runs it through a little computer program that, um, that our customer services run that kind of strips out the right data, does some data matching, gets um, some, does some data validation. It uploads it to the DFE's ECS checker and then sends a report back out to the school. And some of our schools, um, some of our more tech savvy schools just use their MIS systems to export all of their children a couple of times a year that aren't on free school meals. They just run a report out of their, um, most of our schools are on SIMS, um, out of their SIM system, import it into the template and send it off to us. So at any point we can be checking and um, some of our schools can send us like 200 children all at once to to check but that that gives schools the kind of the reassurance that they're that they're not missing children having said that we do still miss children none of this captures everyone we had a child yesterday who um, the parent rang up to say i've received my easter voucher for my older child and i haven't received one for my younger child why have you only sent me one and we had no free school application in for the younger child the child hadn't been through our nursery systems the parent had chosen not to use the electronic primary admissions system and, it, and had instead done a, a paper-based application form and we don't have the functionality in our paper-based to 
collect from our admissions team and convert it electronically. We don't have the resource for that. Um, so she had been she had been missed. So she does now have a free school meal um, claim on. But just want to just want to say that not all of it, not all of this still gets everybody. Uh, which hopefully Miles will come and say something about in his section. Um, so uh, yeah, that's uh, any Q and A's for that one. What perfect timing, Annabelle. Thank you so much. Okay. Right, now we do have a lot of questions. I will reiterate, however, that we will look at these afterwards if we don't get a chance. So please don't be sad if your questions don't get asked. And equally, please do use the function to like questions because that's how I'm going to work it now. Um, and at the top of the, the list at the minute, uh, a question about, that says, what would be the best approach to tightening any gaps around identifying families on universal credit who are also eligible for free school meals? Would an auto enrollment process for CTR on application for universal credit ex, uh, assist? So that, that was kind of our original plan is that we would, we would only ever do this for one year and then uh, Revs and Vens would kind of take it on via um, having an application process for free school meals at the point that they were applying for, not that that's an auto award, um, but that they were applying for, but um, the, there were just too many technical restrictions. We couldn't get um, consent added into how they have their electronic system set up. So it, it just never, it just never happened. Um, and kind of with the automatic thing, yes, it's my firm belief, everything should be automatic local authorities shouldn't be doing any of any processing of the data whatsoever at the point you apply for universal credit um all of the related benefits that you're entitled to should just happen unfortunately no. that's just not that's just not the case but that should be the case that's another it's another thing that's an ideal. Time. <laughs> yeah okay so we've got um a slightly different question now so a few people interested to know uh, how you have linked to the holiday activities and food. I think that means yeah, food to have. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so yeah, for my sins, I'm also involved in half. I don't know, I just get, <laughs> I get all the fun jobs. Um, so no, not currently. Um, currently, we rely on self-declaration of free school meal eligibility for half. Um, but we are aware that that means that there's a strong chance that there are a few people sneaking younger siblings in that aren't transitionally protected. So from later this year, we are moving to an, a, a more electronic system that will give us some more links to free school meals and that will kind of tie the two, the two in to, to know that the people accessing half are the right people and, and who is missing out on on the half and what we can do about that. Yeah, is that just about records as well? Because I, I I seem to recall we did a bit of an evaluation in Sheffield and uh, uh, and and in other areas, in fact, where um, where it's uh, messy. Actually, well, yeah, but in a yeah. nice way in that it was inclusive uh, and it mm -hmm. felt nice that it was inclusive. It's just making sure that those families and children who are entitled actually uh, are able yeah. to to attend. Yeah, I'm working with I'm working with have to have massive leaps in, of improvement of their data collection by September. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That sounds amazing. You are a busy person. Yeah. <laughs> All great, meaningful work though. So, um, uh, we have another question that's gone to the top, but I think it's another question that relates to us giving more information. Um, so I'm gonna skip that one and say that we will. Uh, yeah. I will think about what we, we are also going to uh, support areas and that's something that Annie will uh, talk about later. Okay, so a few people asking how they can access the data for free school meal or pupil premium in their areas. So every, every uh, local authority should have access to the census data. So somebody in your local authority will have access to, uh, it was called DFE Collect, but I don't think it is anywhere. It's been a while since I've worked in that area. But there's a, there's a system in which every local authority can go on. And once all of the schools have submitted their census, and they've been approved by the DFE, you can download a file um, for all of the schools in your local authority and it will tell you, um, you know, who's got uh, free school meals. Don't think it contains the pupil premium 
think the pupil premium stuff, well, I know who it goes to in our local authority, but I don't actually know what their job role is. What's um, what's Helen's job role, Sarah? Goes to, oh, goes to Jackie even, what's, is it DSG? You're muted, Sarah. Oh, she's... Um, I don't know whether it's resourcing manager or something like that. She's school school budgets, isn't it? It's, school budgets. I don't know whether it's resourcing manager. I'm not sure. So yeah, so take a bit of investigation work, yeah. and I suspect yeah, so it will differ. Really. Should go to somebody who deals with school budgets. School yeah. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Your free school meal data. Uh, whoever works on your education system um, will be able to access that information for you. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Dif different role names probably in different areas as yeah. well. Um, I want to ask you a question, Sarah, coming back to some of the impact data. Um, have you looked at whether or not there has been, and of course this is not necessarily causal, but have you looked at your National Child Measurement Programme data uh, since you started to see whether it looks any different? No, no, it's not. Okay. No. I think there might be people interested to do that, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and, and rightly so, Pete, the, the question comes from someone that, uh, mm. has stated that this is, this is uh, looking to see proportion of children who are uh, defined as underweight as well as those living with obesity. Right. So I think that might be, that might be something to, to yeah. Yeah. Um Okay, um, another similar one, I think, to one of the questions, have you replicated this process for other benefit entitlements, e entitlements e.g. pension credit top up? No. No, because it's just us. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. It means in theory it could be done. However, there's there's more, there's plenty to be done in the day yeah. job. Mm. Okay, super. Um, okay, so there's another question about whether or not you have um, spoken to caterers to get their perspective of this. Is that, is that something that you've considered? Um, we did because because. Um, because of where I'm from, the school food service, and we manage a contract with, you know, we, we did consult with schools. We did a lot of communication with schools around what we were doing because it did mean that they're going to hopefully see an increase in free school meal take up or children are in, uh, having school dinners and things. So we did do a lot of sort of comms to schools to tell them what we were doing, when mm -hmm. we were doing it, um, and, and, and the impact of it. And it's a good news story for schools because they were getting additional pupil premium funding. Um, <clears throat> Um, yeah, and, yeah. and the, the part, the, the bit of my project that was about um, take up free school meals, part of that project was working with our catering provider on how, you know, you know, working on with schools on an individual basis then about um, maximising take up really, what is it in that school that, that's not working that we need to do better, are there any schools that are doing something really well that we can share, have we got some models of good practice that we could share, we had we had um, one primary school in particular that with universal infant free school meals, they piloted um, the summer term that all children <clears throat> in key stage one had to have a school meal and they had to sit together and have a school meal. And um, parent, the parents that were really concerned about it were allowed to bring in a packed lunch as a backup plan, but the children still had to sit with their friends and have a school lunch. And if they wouldn't eat it, parents were reassured that they'd still got a pack up and actually that that pilot was really successful and um, there were a couple of parents where the business manager sent photographs home every day of the meal that their child had eaten but they got a lot of positive feedback from parents about um you know um the quality of the meal and they were really surprised that the child was trying something that they wouldn't try at home because they were sat with their friends mm -hmm. um, and they ended up rolling that out from the from September as a as a thing that they did and it became the norm for those children and then we shared that practice with other other schools and one or two other schools tried it as well um sounds amazing Sarah I'm taking notes it's a what a great idea it's really it's so good when you can hear things that have worked in in other schools that people could that people can give a go and I guess Uptake is obviously uh, influenced by a number of different things. Mm -hmm. uh, universally, of course, the, the, what the offer looks like, how it's presented is important. Yeah, um, yeah. But we do have some questions about the stigma. And I, and I wonder, we've been into a lot of schools recently, mm -hmm. and I'm happy to say that there's no way that you can distinguish, on the whole, there's no way that you can distinguish those children who are mm -hmm. eligible for free school meals from children who aren't. Um, I guess there's something to be done then about communication and perhaps this is sort of a, 
a historical thing that when those families as parents, if they had free school meals themselves, maybe it wasn't the same situation. But have you done anything? Have you have you been working with the schools to uh, to think about that? I mean, again, as part of the project I did, and, and and the school food service, that's part of their their work anyway, because they work with the group that this, the schools that they've got on an individual basis and look at things like that. But mm -hmm. I don't think stigma. I don't feel that stigma is as, as, as a big thing as it was in years gone by. We've got secondary schools all have biometric systems now where no one knows which children, you know, we've not got a raffle ticket system anymore or anything like that. We've got children that go through with a fingerprint and, and likewise for primary schools. And we're, we're in a situation now because of auto awards and the other um, initiatives that Annabelle's talked about, we don't have a situation where parents got to go into school reception and hand over an application form. Um, and that, you know that that it, it's it's not um they're not raising raising the sources that I'm entitled to free school meals. This is my form, and I do think there was a sense as well. Some of the feedback that I got before when I did the project was, you know, in these local community schools, sometimes the lady on reception was your next door neighbour or somebody that you knew in your community, and you didn't want that person that you yeah. knew to to know yeah. that you were applying for free school meals. So the so I think auto awards. We, we've got around that and the other initiatives because we've got so few people that have to actually physically apply for a free school meal themselves I don't think stigma is such a big thing anymore likewise yeah. children aren't identified in primary schools either anymore um, yeah. yeah it's great to hear it's great to hear so it's a positive move I suppose it's sharing that information isn't it with the, with the family yeah. so um, so we do need to move on now. Thank you so much, both of you. It, it, I, I, even though you know we've been working alongside you for a while, I'm still learning so much. Every you know to, to hear you speak today has been fantastic. So thank you so much. Please hang around because there, there might be a chance for more questions later. Uh, but Miles, I'm very happy to, uh, to hand over to you now. Maria, thank you. And um, I saw a hand uh, clap come up on the uh, screen many hand claps and I would just like to echo that I'm sure on behalf of all of the participant uh, the participants what a rich uh, and important presentation full of detail um, and I could see in the chat lots and lots of requests for uh, the the process the case study because there is so much that we can learn from the excellent work that Sheffield has done. Um, what I'd like to do just in five minutes is sort of sum, sum up some of the um, opportunities and challenges that come about not only uh, from the case study that Sheffield and some other local authorities have been doing around um, making the current process and the current system better, but also to see what opportunities there might be for all of us as actors within the school food system to call for um, some advocacy and change in terms of, um, you know, are there ways to make the whole system more efficient? And um, you will see on the right hand side here, um, there is, um, you know, lots of effort and um, engagement from MPs and other um, politicians around the fact that um, there is an issue nationally about under registration um, and um, the DfE respond and say that around 11 percent of pupils are not registering um, the challenge is we actually don't know how many are not registered um, there's a challenge in some of the narrative in terms of the use of the words around entitlement, the use of the words around illegibility. Um, but that shouldn't take away the fact that the DfE are you answering data which is 10 years old. Um, and the DfE used to uh, conduct an annual uh, review using HMRC data and DfE data to clarify and confirm um, the number of pupils who are not registering for free school meals. Um, but that data is 10 years old. And throughout the last um, few years, there have been a number of guesstimate reports um, 
to sort of try and clarify and confirm what the issue is. Um, you can see the Child Poverty Action Group have, have calculated an analysis of the Northeast, that it was around 10%. Um, and if we calculate this up, then of course, it is uh, an incredible number of children that are already entitled to free school meals, um, but are, are, are not um, registered as being eligible. Next slide, please. Another challenge we have is that we don't know what the data is um, in respective local authorities. The um, matrix on the right hand side is taken from the last um, data that the DfE commissioned back in 2013. And you can see in the rates on the right hand side that these are the calculated under registration rates. Um, that DfE produced. And, and we can see that there is a wide variety um, in, in um, between different local authorities. Um, this data in, a, in some senses is, is meaningless, but uh, now because it is so old, but it does suggest that unitary authorities do have um, sort of a, the ability to be able to share and access data um, using you know, the methods that Sarah and Annabelle uh, talked about um, more than, than uh, single authorities or, or county councils um, and so on. And over the last 10 years, we've seen within local authorities a real mixed um, picture in terms of the relationship that the local authority has through to its schools not least within the whole academies um, sort of policy and the rollout of academies, but also the educational school service um, and the provision of uh, support and resources, whether that is a free service or, or a paid service, I think has meant that the level of current support and engagement the local authority is able to offer to its schools using um, and supporting schools with the eligibility checking service has varied. So um, next slide, please. So what is it that we can do? Well, I, I think there are three sort of narratives, uh, sorry, narrative. I think there are three parts of the conversation. So first of all, surely it's reasonable to ask the Department for Education for up-to-date information. Um, we heard from Sarah and Annabelle that the rollout of universal credit, the application of transitional protection, um, the different data sets is, is challenging, um, even you know, for well-resourced Sheffield, dedicated Sheffield to get the full picture. Um, we know that national government can uh, do that, so surely it's reasonable to ask for up-to-date data. Um, I'm going to skip to the third ask, which is it not time to introduce a better system of auto-enrollment at a national level so that the burden of administration shouldn't be sat at school or sat at local authority. Um, we should use the data sets that are there to, to just help us um, roll that out. But that will take time. Um, IT systems need to be built. Um, processes need to be agreed. Um, and, and, and resources need to be to be allocated. So in the meantime, um, how can we support all of you as local authorities to adopt um, and use better automation and opt out mechanisms to enable the current um, process? And I think we should be asking DFE for clarity on the data protection and the permissions and the consent aspect, um, because that's going to be really important, I think, for local authorities to give that confidence to um, cabinet members that there are no legal issues and that it is in the common interest. So I'll leave it there. Um, I found it such a rich um, it, amount of information. Um, and thank you again, Sheffield, for sharing your um, case study. I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm oh, hoping yeah. you're not waiting for me, uh, uh, Annie. I think what I'll do is I'll pass this last session section on to you. Are you happy with that? 
Yeah, yeah, I started talking, but um, <laughs> good. Sorry, everyone. Right. Um, yeah, we just wanted to close up quickly because we want to finish promptly at 12.30. But um, uh, that was certainly for me a really interesting hour and a half. Thanks to um, Sarah and Annabelle and to Miles. And in terms of next steps, so um, we at Fix Our Food are a Yorkshire-based programme. And so what we are able to offer is support to Yorkshire local authorities um, around um, certainly sharing information to support implement, in, the implementation of these auto enrolment processes. But we can definitely um, support you with monitoring and evaluating the impact. So what we wanted to say today was um, email us with expressions of interest if you want to work with us, if you're a Yorkshire local authority. But uh, what I'd say to other local authorities is once we have that data, we can share it more widely in order, and hopefully that will support the work that you're doing. Um, and also uh, we will get in touch with you after today with the details about the DFA and anything else that people have been asking in the Q&A. So hopefully that will be useful too. So that is, um, the kind of stuff that's happening on a local level. Um, just to carry on from what Miles has been saying, there's obviously uh, work that needs, been, needs to be done on a national level as well. Um, and if you are interested in supporting advocacy work around that, maybe if it's just kind of adding your name to a letter or, or something more, um, it would be good to hear from you um, and then we can get in touch if we move forward on that in any way we haven't got any kind of plan at the moment but again email me if you are interested in supporting work around advocating for change at a national level um so i that's it from me maria have you um got anything else to say thank you for everybody for joining us today we'll be in touch the eventbrite sign up um, included a, a link, um, a, 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 an element that said, can we get in touch with you after this? So hopefully everybody will have said yes, um, but you, my email is here, so you can contact me directly with any further questions or if you are interested in getting involved. So um, I'll pass back to Maria to close, but I've seen that Annabelle's popped up as well, so I didn't know if she wanted to say anything quickly no okay thanks everybody and I'll pop over to Maria yeah just just very really quickly to just once again say huge huge thank you to both Annabelle and Sarah um, and also to Miles um, I've found this just so informative um, and you know the, the your ability to answer on the spot all those some quite technical questions as well really demonstrates you know how engaged you are in this uh, in, in terms of your knowledge. So just, just a big, big thank you. Uh, I hopefully will, you know, this is the start of, a, of lots to come uh, and with m as many children who are entitled as possible actually getting their, their free school meal. So um, hugely useful, beneficial and meaningful work. So thank you everyone. And thank you everyone for coming. <laughs>